Hello to my viewing audience, our viewing audience. Uh, once again, this is the next episode of Conversations with John, where every time we do this, uh, we bring into the, the dialogue somebody who has been engaged in the work of the, the church, and in this particular season, especially work around the pandemic, the COVID virus that we're all fighting. Our guest today is none other than my friend and colleague, uh, the Reverend Tina Campbell. Uh, Tina, why don't you introduce yourself, welcome, and say a few words about who you are and the ministry that you're engaged in. Well, it's great to see John, who was at one time our conference minister in the Southwest, where I am delighted to say I reside and have been here for a long time. Uh, I've also a beautiful been, place it is. Yep. I've also been ordained in the UCC for a long time. And much of my ministry has been with the marginalized and outside of the parish setting. Uh, I worked many years with drug addicts and alcoholics for whom this is a very difficult time, whether they are in recovery or still active in their illness. I spent 10 years as a full-time prison chaplain, and my heart actually anguishes for the situation for our inmates who yeah. in Arizona are starting to die. Um, <clears throat> And I have also done work as a hospice chaplain, and I have done uh, parish work also. I am currently a staff chaplain at Phoenix Children's Hospital, which is a, a beautiful place. Uh, we have about 300 beds for um, children, but the actual hospital setting you would not recognize as being the same one that we had several months ago. So the talk usual, a little bit then about what's different. What, what are you seeing? What are you experiencing that you would not have recognized a couple of months ago? The usual um, atmosphere of our hospital is that it's actually a happy place. Um, the lobby is usually full of hustle and bustle and people. We have 50 therapy dogs who are usually present in the hospital ministering to both staff and the children. Uh, we usually have uh, literally hundreds of visitors coming in and out of the hospital. Some are family members and friends of the patients, but others are people from the community. Um, everybody from athletic teams to theater troops uh, really support the work of this hospital. We also have special programs for the kids where they can go into a, what what would look like a normal recreation room and play games and um, make crafts and so forth. And now the hospital lobby looks like a ghost town. Mm. Um, all volunteers have been terminated for the time being. I shouldn't say terminate, but put on furlough. None of our dogs are coming in. Uh, the kids can't gather in the recreation rooms. Um, for the staff, we have to uh, give our temperature each day before we come to work. And when we enter the hospital, there's a tent set up that gives us one surgical mask that we're allowed to wear all day and um, some gloves. Um, so that's a minor inconvenience. But the biggest change uh, is only one parent is allowed mm. in the room with at one time. And so parents are literally making life and death decisions over the phone with very little privacy. Um, imagine the anguish on top of anguish, because even though we don't like to awfulize any situation, there is truly nothing more difficult for human beings than to see their child at risk. And so this is exacerbated during this time. So two things uh, I want to share in response to that before I ask my next question. The first is uh, I've been talking with chaplains and local clergy across the country who talk about members of their church who are in the hospital dying, recovering from illness and not being able to go see them and family members prevented from seeing them even as their loved one might be dying. 
And I've sort of processed all of that through sort of an end of life experience. But now we're talking about children. It really hadn't occurred to me. And the second thing I want to say about that is I'm a parent who for a month walked, lived in a hotel room with my daughter. I can't imagine the days that I spent in there with Mimi getting through that where one of us had to determine who was going to be with our daughter and who wasn't. And yes, every day we were making life and death decisions. And I can't imagine doing that over the phone without being present. And hearing you talk about this just opens up a whole new level of, of pain and grief for me. I can't imagine what it's like for you, not only dealing with the, the children, but with the parents and the families who have to process all of this. And the staff. And that, was, that was my next question. Uh, the other thing I'm consistently hearing from those in chaplaincy work is the ministry they're doing with the staff and what they're processing now, because many of them are not just, uh, we talk about the heroic actions of them putting their life on the line. Many of them now are becoming patients themselves in the process or watching the people that they work with become patients and then going home to families and having to deal with what do we do now when we get home and what's what's that been like well one of the um tough parts of being on the staff right now is they are the ones who have to enforce the new rules okay and so, so they're telling they the parents, the ones, you can't come in here exactly they're also telling, um, we have new rules. Uh, chaplains are asked not to go into isolation rooms unless the child is actively dying. Um, and most of our rooms now, frankly, are isolation rooms because people throughout the country are advised not to go to the hospital unless you absolutely have to. So you're putting your child at risk just to take them to an emergency room or just to take them to the hospital and so forth. And even though our children are at a lower risk level, they're still at a risk level. And we have kids who have had organ transplants. We have kids who are going through chemo. We have um, kids who are intubated and these kids are really at, at high risk. Mm. We also have many families who don't speak English. And yeah. so, at our hospital, we are really fortunate that we have a whole team of interpreters. And last weekend, I used two interpreters who helped me baptize a child whose parents' native language was Mayan. Um, so we had one person who spoke Spanish and the other person who translated from there. So the intricacies just go on and on. Our cafeteria is no longer serving the same kind of food it is, and people are able to have pick-up meals. Um, for some of the kids, boredom is their biggest challenge right now. Right. Keeping an, can you imagine a young John Dorhauer confined with your... No. To a, no. Well, they wouldn't and be allowed to come. The other thing I can remember <laughs> is when my daughter came out of the coma and went through rehab, um, at that point, Mimi and I would take turns being with her for a week at a time, and we were constantly reading to her, pushing her in her wheelchair around the hospital, visiting other patients, taking her for walks. To think of her through that time of recovery, alone in a room all day without anybody able to come in, I just, I can't imagine what that would be like for that child. I cannot imagine. And now, of course, walks are not a possibility. If a parent comes out of the room, they can't go back in. Mm -hmm. um, and the other parent has to relieve them. Of course, the kids can't go out in the playground. Their siblings right. are not allowed to come and see them. Um, this is where, though, technology is the blessing. Yeah. And I'm the most untechnology person, <laughs> but I've come. How and, it and I want our viewers so to, to know that about Tina, that, that I got her on this Zoom call for this interview is quite a coup. <laughs> it is. It's a major accomplishment, but I'm trying to learn new things. And we all have to learn new things in this time of, of challenge. But the thing about a children's hospital that many people would find amazing, 
I can honestly say I have never heard one parent complain in the hospital. I have seen them sob. I have seen them uh, doubled over in grief, but I have never heard them complain. So right there, Thanks. we're dealing with people. And I think that it's honest to say that everybody is just trying to make the best of things. I did find on Easter Sunday that it was a solemn day. Yeah. Um, it was not a day, uh, somebody had given me a pair of rabbit ears, I never put them on. It was not a day where we have our usual fun um, yeah. time with the kids. It was a day where people really noticed they could not gather and they could not be together. And our chapel was filled with written prayer requests, um, parents trying to connect with an outside community. I think a lot of people um, found comfort in being able to attend church on the on the uh, computer. Um, our conference minister, Bill Lyons, has been wonderful about keeping in touch with all the chaplains, and we have um, weekly telephone calls. He himself is the chaplain, so I think he understands the role. Um, People are trying to support those of us who are on the front lines and um, doing pastoral care with us. Uh, as you can imagine, John Herman was there immediately <laughs> for me. I can imagine. Uh, um, for those of our viewers, John Herman is a, a much respected elder clergy in the, the conference, the Southwest Conference, and a mutual dear friend of both Tina's and mine. And uh, um, I have been watching and, from somewhat of a distance that the work that Bill Lyons has been doing in the conference and to chaplains and to others, it has been absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, and he excels at pastoral care and that's what the clergy need right now yeah. is, um, is pastoral care. And um, I think that we can't really afford to think too much. We just need to suit up and show up. Uh, you know, this I is who we are. I, I this is what a, we do. I interviewed a chaplain last week um, who was presumed positive uh, and in home just suffering from uh, the disease. And I, I asked her, how do you feel as a chaplain knowing that you were literally putting yourself at risk by doing this? And she said the same thing, John, this is what we were called to do. Right. It just, right. it's still... It's a, it was an emotional experience to hear that. I am so grateful to you, Tina, to all of our chaplains for the work that you were doing. And one of the things that I'm hearing from clergy is that a part of their grief around this is they can't go to see members in their church or in the hospital, but they have all been receiving calls from chaplains saying, give us the names and reach out to us and, and right. we will take care of that. Um, one final question, and, and maybe it's too early, but maybe it's not. In the midst of any of this, are you seeing anything that gives you hope, that gives you a reason to continue to believe in, in the goodness of the world and humanity at writ large? Everything I see gives me that. <laughs> of course you're going to say that, Tina. That is so you. It's who we are. Um, yeah. When something happens, we roll up our sleeves. We reach out to each other. We definitely pretty much have a no whining rule amongst each other. Um, we keep each other going and um, we don't know how to be anybody else. I see hope everywhere I look. People are being kind to each other. Um, I'm around death anyway, so that's not a new experience for me. I know it is new for others. Um, I think we have seen the best of humanity in, in a very difficult time. Uh, we're finding ways to, I live by myself, so I do see each other at a social, see people at a social distance, um, because otherwise I think there's mental health and spiritual health in addition to yeah. physical health. So um, sometimes it's just nice to see a friend 10 feet away and have a cup coffee. Um, frankly, I don't think we give it a second thought what we're doing. And I don't think that we can afford to have any doom and gloom right now. 
I think my kids at the hospital and their parents are some of the most courageous people I've ever seen. And I feel I have absolutely nothing to complain about. <laughs> and I continue to well, be grateful for my ministry. Tina, you're reminding me once again why I not only love you so much, but why I respect you so much. I'm grateful well, to you, you for this time. Um, I certainly received my gratitude and the gratitude of the entire United Church of Christ for the ministry that you do each and every day. And uh, for those who are listening, that, that is a gratitude that extends to all of our chaplains out there for the work that they are doing. It is extraordinary. And I think you have encapsulated well the spirit of all of those who serve in this ministry. Tina, thank you for being with me and for having this conversation. And God bless you, John. Thank Bye you. for now. Goodbye. And to our viewers, uh, this has been Conversations with John, my guest today, the Reverend Tina Campbell. Uh, we look forward to the next conversation. Thank you for being with us.